Father, we just thank you again for this morning. Lord, just a time to meet, a place to meet. And Lord, so blessed to have people we want to meet with. But Lord, we meet with you now. We lift your name in worship and praise and prayer, Lord, and now we open your word and we just ask that you would speak to us in a mighty fashion and that we would be touched and we would be changed and we would be encouraged by what you have to say to us. And so we yield to your spirit now. We turn this time over to you and we just ask that you would speak to us. And we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So earlier this week, I was having a text conversation with a brother in the Lord. And a comment was made to me in that text conversation about Scripture. And when the comment was made, it sounded more of a question than it did a comment. And it got me thinking. And the question that I heard in the comment that this person made was, does the Bible, and I'm rephrasing what he said, but the question I heard was, does the Bible speak much about fire you know and I, I didn't think very deep on it i just kind of said well yeah and i gave a couple examples not that he really even asked for input from me but i gave a couple examples of where it talked about that and then yesterday i after the men's breakfast i went home did a couple things and then finally settled down in, in my office front in, in my desk and was going to review my notes for today which would have been which was nehemiah chapter 5 and I was probably at my desk for maybe an hour, and I just kind of paused, and I looked up out of the window, just, which is just kind of past my screens, and I was just watching the smoke move through the trees. And I thought about that conversation, and I thought about that question, and I thought how much I really didn't give a good answer. And, um, and the Lord just kind of laid it on my heart that uh, that was really what he wanted me to talk about today. And so that study of Nehemiah chapter 5, which should have been today, will come next week. And so I just want to really open that up because, I mean, it's on all of our minds, the fire. I mean, it's hard not to. The, the destruction, the tragedy, um, the questions that we all have about what we've witnessed this week, conflicting news as to what really has caused the fires news that says that evil people are doing evil things and then our authorities telling us that no that's not what's happening and yet there it is right in front of us happening and so i don't want to weigh too much on the news that's not that's not what i think the lord gave me but let's answer that question just because it's on our minds and we say as believers that there's not a topic that the bible doesn't speak about so what does it say about fire and no, we're not going to describe what we're seeing in a biblical fashion, although for many it seems biblical. You know, when I think about that topic and when I yielded to what I thought the Lord was saying to me, the first verse that came to my mind, the first place I went, and just to warn you, we're going to go through quite a bit of scripture. I didn't have the time to really put together a PowerPoint to help us with that, so you're just going to have to jot down, if you're a note taker, those addresses and do your best to listen and follow but the first place that the lord took me was hebrews chapter 12 verse 29 and in that verse we read these words and i think most of us know them well we've talked about them before and it says therefore our god is a consuming fire we could probably just rest there thinking on that verse meditating upon that consuming fire what a title what a title for this God that we pray to, that we reach out to, that we depend upon, that we know to be faithful. That he would describe himself as a consuming fire. And that, that term there, it means what it says. We don't have to go too deep into the Greek. The English really does well. But if I had to give an alternate definition, I would say that he's telling us that he utterly devours. And really that speaks to his power. Now, any good Bible student, and I've told you this before, and I encourage you to make this your practice, when you come upon a topic that you're going to consider biblically, always, always ask yourself the question, where was this mentioned first? It's actually called the principle of first mention. 
If you can ask yourself that question about a particular topic when you go to study it biblically, you will find the riches of what is being spoke about in that first occurrence. And so the first occurrence of the fact that God is a consuming fire comes to us all the way back in the first few books of the Old Testament, in particular Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, it says there, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. And then there's a comma, and it says, A jealous God. He's a consuming fire and a jealous God. And we would ask the question, what is he jealous for? What is the object of his jealousy? Well, the object of his jealousy is us. He is jealous for us. And I know some people have a problem with considering God with an issue like jealousy. I don't think it's so much an issue for God as it's a confession of God, of his own care and love, and how extensive that is for us, that he would be jealous for us. It's not the jealousy that we think of. It's not that green envy that, that we might have in our flesh for something or someone. This is a genuine care and desire a passion that the Lord has for us and what he wants from us. So he's jealous for us. But then we could ask a different question, phrased in a different way. What's he jealous of? We know what he's jealous for. It's us. But what's he jealous of? Well, we're going to discover that as we continue this study. So where do we find the second occurrence of this picture that we have as God as a consuming fire? Well, it's in this very same book. It's in Deuteronomy, five chapters later, chapter 9, verse 3. And there it says, Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. And so this picture that we have given of God being a consuming fire, it's not just something that he is, it's also something that he does. And we're going to find out in this study that he does it in our lives and he does it outside of our lives to preserve us. And here he's speaking to the Hebrew people that were going to cross the Jordan into the promised land. And he was telling them, as a consuming fire, I am going before you to fight the battles that I'm sending you into. So this whole concept of him being a consuming fire, as awesome as that may seem as we say it and considering it, it's also something that needs to come to us as a word of comfort. That he consumes. He consumes and he consumes with fire and he does it for us because he cares so greatly about us. So we located that first occurrence in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24. And what I want to do now is I want to look, as any good Bible student would, at the verse that preceded it. Verse 23. And this is what that verse said. It said, Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. So in that verse, we get the answer to the question, what is God jealous of? Well, what God is jealous of is anything that comes between him and us. That's what he's jealous of. Of anything that comes between he and us. And he says there, he wants us to have attention to those things lest we forget. And if we forget, he knows that we'll make for ourselves a carved image in the form of anything. If we don't have him as our primary focus, then what he's warning us of is we will put something there to worship. And the truth, brothers and sisters, is even with him as our focus, we struggle not to have other things that we worship. And that is what he's jealous of. And that is what he wants to consume. And he does it by fire. Now, it's not necessarily the fire as we're observing this week, but his deed, an intensity, a heat, a fervent heat that goes after those things in our lives that shouldn't be there. He says, if we forget the covenant, well, what is that covenant? Well, there's an Old Testament covenant. There's a New Testament covenant. 
And really in the New Testament covenant, he just took the covenant of the Old Testament and wrote it on our hearts, we're told. And something that we're instructed in the Old Testament that applies in the New Testament is what our focus is to be, what our side of the covenant with him is supposed to be. And that also comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And there it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's our part of the covenant. And if we could accomplish what that verse says, asks us to do, demands that we do, commands that we do, then really we'll have no time for the things that would come in between God and us. But in that process, we need to allow him as that consuming fire to assist us, to work with us, to work for us in clearing the decks so that he has all of us, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength. Now let's look at that second occurrence that we talked about in Deuteronomy. That second occurrence that happened in chapter 9, verse 3, where it mentioned consuming fire. What I read to you was just the first part of that verse. I want to read that first part again, and I want to add the second. The first part of that verse that I read was, Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. Second part of the verse. He will destroy them and bring them down before you. So you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said to you. And so he goes before us, he fights for us, he fights with us, he leads us into the battle. And he's telling us here that he will destroy them. What's them? Again, it's all those things that might come between us and God. All those things that we would serve instead of him. All those things that we would worship instead of worshiping him. And he's speaking of all things. He's not giving us an out. He's not saying, well here, this stack, okay. This one, not. He's not allowing anything to be okay to come in between he and us. Nothing. He's saying all things. Whether they're idols or they're giants, literal giants, which was what the Hebrews were facing. Habits, thoughts, addictions, distractions, sickness or health. And you say, wait a minute. I can understand sickness being a distraction, but how could health be a distraction? We can idolize our health. I'm not saying we shouldn't be those that are trying to be healthy because this is something God gave us to take care of. But I I see anything having the potential to be something we would idolize and worship and put before the Lord. But he's saying he'll drive these things out, he'll destroy them. But often, often, it's up to us to put these things on the altar so that they would be burnt away. That's our part of it as well. We can hope all we want that he'll take and he'll burn away. We could lay down and just expect him to do the work. But in our understanding of ourselves and the confession that's so important to the Lord and to others, when we see those things, we need in our hearts, our minds to take them, put them upon the altars that the fires would burn those things away, would cleanse us, would cleanse the walk we have with the Lord. Now there's several incidents in the scripture which God's wrath and judgment and holiness and his power displayed in the form of fire from heaven. I want to recall a few of those. There was Aaron's sons, the priests, the sons of the priest, you might recall, Abihu and Nadab. They were destroyed by fire. Why? Because they offered profane sacrifice, a strange fire upon the altar in the tabernacle. And it was a sign of their disregard for the holiness of God And it also disregarded their need to honor him in a solemn and holy fear. We are to fear him who is a consuming fire. What does that mean to fear him? It means to not want the other side of who he is. We don't want his wrath. We don't want his judgment. And as Christians, we are spared from most of that which is coming upon the world in the form of judgment, in the form of wrath. But if we're not in fear of him, we're going to miss the blessings, the full blessings 
Because that fear should bring us to a point where we want those things that come in between he and us burned away. We want those things out of our lives. Because we want the fullness of him. Another thing we read about was the confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal there on Mount Carmel. It's another example of God in his consuming fire. The prophets of Baal, they called, remember, on their God all day long. They called for him to rain fire from heaven, but was to no avail. Then Elijah built an altar of stones, dug a ditch around it, put the sacrifice on the top of the wood, and he called for water to be poured over his sacrifice three times all around the altar there. And then Elijah called upon God, and God sent fire down from heaven. He completely consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and licked all the water from that scene. And then God's anger turned against the false prophets, and they were all kindled. That's what it means for God to be a consuming fire. He will eliminate our enemies. Not all of them now, but in the end, all will be eliminated. And in the meanwhile, we have our personal enemies. We have the sin that so easily besets us. We have all those things that we need to go, here's a list, let me put it there and have it burned away. It's a continuous thing. It's something we always need to be thinking about. It's a process that isn't done just once. And the reason for that is because in our flesh, we keep taking those things back. But we find out that we had our fingers crossed behind our back when we gave it to God the first time. The last example, Isaiah, he prophesied the destruction of the Assyrians who resisted the true and living God and warred against his people. He referred to the tongue of the Lord as a consuming fire. And he talked about his arm with the indignation of his anger and the flame of a devouring fire. And so that image of the fire, it assists us in our walk before the Lord. It clears the decks of the things that would trip us up and get in the way of him having our lives fully. But it also is a picture of what he does to our enemies. Because our enemies are his enemies. And although he's fighting for us, he's also fighting for his own glory. Let's uh, bring ourselves into the New Testament. Let's hear what Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote about this topic. I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. And here he reminds us, he makes a bold statement in the first verse of this passage. He says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And I pray for all of those that have lost in this week, in this fire. I pray for them, that although they may have lost the foundation, the very foundation they lived in, that they would find the foundation that is in Jesus Christ. I hope that's what this leads them to, those that don't yet know him. Now Paul goes on and he says this, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And so the things that we have, the things that we own, we're told that in the end, if not before then, they will all be tested by fire. And that if not now, in the end, all of those things that are earthly, that are temporal, will be burned away. We will not take them with us. And so we need to evaluate everything we have in such a manner, knowing that it will be tested someday like that. And when we sit and we watch all these people that have lost so much, and we look at the things we have, those of us that did not lose. And we need to evaluate for ourselves, is that where our heart is at? Or is our heart in heaven? Because if our heart in, is in heaven, then those things, although we might suffer because of their loss, ultimately, as it says here, we might look like we went through the trial of fire. But in the end, if we're saved, we're still saved. We can lose all that we have here on this earth. 
But if we're saved, that's one thing that we're guaranteed. Unless by choice you walk away from it, but then I would wonder if you ever were saved. Tested by fire. And the truth is, many of us, most of us, I believe in this room, haven't had it come directly against their dwelling. But yet, even at a distance, we're all being tested this week by fire. Because we're having to reevaluate what we believe and how strongly we believe it. We're having to reevaluate again the things we have and what if we had to save them? What would be most important? And we're seeing just how fragile life is. How fast it can all just go. And we need to be prepared for that. And I would hope and I'll pray that none of us will ever have to suffer what we've watched others suffer this week. But could we do it and still walk through it with a face, a faith that's not tattered? With a faith that that's still strong without questioning whether God loves us or he really cares about us because of the things that we suffer sometimes. You know, when I think about this picture, I, I think about Daniel. I think about the prophet Daniel and I think about his three friends, Hebrews in captivity in Babylon under that King Nebuchadnezzar that called them to worship something that wasn't of the true God and they refused. And I think about their journey and I think about the trial that they had by fire. And it's such an important story for us because it really describes what we can expect from our God in our times of trial, whether by fire or other. I want us to, to look at that story. And I want you to remember that when we consider what happens to these three young men that were friends of Daniel, I want you to see their strength, but I want to remind you that they are young men. There's a great chance that Daniel and his compatriots here were in their teens. And I want, to see, I want you to see the fortitude that they had because of the God they served. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 15, the instruction went out to all in that kingdom. And it says, now if you are ready at the time, you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in sym symphony with all kinds of music. And you fall down and worship the image which I have made good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? That was the decree of King Nebuchadnezzar. That as soon as you heard the music, as soon as you heard the lyrics, you would fall down and worship the image of that king. Well, these men had made up their mind that that wasn't the route that they were going to go. And I encourage us in this story that we don't want to wait till that time comes to decide whether we're going to worship or not. We don't want to be in the midst of the fiery trial as we all are this week and not have already made up our mind where our strength comes from and how we will worship the true God no matter what. And in these days when we're trying to when they're trying to overcome the church with the laws and the dictates of man, we need to already have made up our mind what we will not bow to. Now it goes on in the stories Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, "O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. That's a good place to start. If that is the case, speaking of the decree that he just gave, they go on and they say this, they say, Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. And then they say something very interesting. They say, but if not, let it be known to you, O king that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. So they said they knew their God could overcome whatever they, was, they were handed, that their God would overcome, but they could not dictate, and in their wisdom they stated so exactly how God would overcome. But they knew that that God would remain the same, whether he pulled them out of the fire or not. And my question for us is, do we believe that? Do we believe that we can walk into the fires of this world, whether literal or metaphorical, and know that the God that we serve will rescue us? And it may not come in the fashion that we desire it 
It may not come with the speed that we would ask for. But do we believe today that he will come and he will do what he said? That is something you need to decide now. A few verses later, it says, Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. In their fiery trial, and we were told they stoked that furnace to seven times its normal heat. We're told that those that put them into the fire were consumed by the heat that came out of that open door. And this king looks into that fire, sees these three young men, and he sees one like the Son of God with them. Do we believe that he walks through the fire with us? And it says, And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. We could come into a time of a literal fire as we have this week. I know that the numbers of those that have perished is going to go up. And I know that some that have perished this week are in heaven right now with the Lord because they were believers. And you may say to me, then why use this example? Why tell me that God's going to rescue me if he would allow me to perish in something like this tragedy? Because if you're a believer then the moment you expire here, you are there. You are in his presence. If that's not God saving you, then I don't know what is. It may not be the form that you wished. It may not be that you be saved to continue upon this life, on this earth. But the alternative for you to end here is to begin there. That you can have confidence in. And the last verse I'll share from this says, Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel, capital A, and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word, and yielded their bodies, and they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. An ungodly king recognizing once again the power of the true God, and then he gives in that moment his own testimony of what he saw and permission to them to worship only their own god. See, it's our confidence, it's our assuredness, it's the way that we walk through these things that speak to others. We need to know how important our conduct is, our godly conduct. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1 and 2. There it says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. That's God speaking. And if you're here this morning or you're listening to this later and you're saved, then that word's for you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you, the Lord says. I have called you by your name. You are mine. A brother spoke earlier about how God named every star. He knows the number of the grains of sand on the seashore. He calls us by name. That's how personal of a God he is. And he goes on and he says, when you pass through the waters, I will be there with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. And you can say, no, wait a minute. We, we, we just admitted that some may have perished, that we're actually believers in the Lord. Yes. But what would have perished in the fire? Their flesh. If they're a believer, their soul has carried on and is in the presence of the Almighty God. And even if they weren't a believer, their soul survived. But heaven's not where they ended up. These two verses I'm about to share are very precious to me. 
They've been life verses for me. They've gotten me through tough times. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, in the beginning of 8. It says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. So let's take that backwards. It begins with the fact that we know the Lord, we love the Lord. And the faith that we have placed in Him will be tested by fire. Sometimes literally. Other times metaphorically by the circumstances that you're in. But it tells us that the ways in which we are tried are the things that will shine the greatest. Because our proof, because our faith will be proved in those moments. Proved to us, proved to the God we serve, and proved to those around us that are watching us go through those times. And the comfort in those words is that whatever comes is only going to be for a little while. Now, what is a little while to you is probably different than what a little while is to me. And I guarantee your little while, my little while, is different than what God sees. But we're promised that whatever we're going through will be for a little while. That little while may be the 70, 80, 90 years you live. But in the scale of eternity, it's just a little while. And then it says these three very important words. If need be. So that tells me that not only will it be a little while, but God says that whatever I'm going through, whatever you're going through, there's a need. There's a need. Whatever we're facing right now, there's a need. And it's horrible. And I believe a lot of it's been done by evil people. And so it's hard for us to wrap our minds around how could there be a need in this? Well, I'm not God, so I can't answer that. But he wastes nothing. And he's on the throne. And he is sovereign. And things are happening by, happening by providence. And so we just have to put our faith in that. That God's at work. And whatever needs to come through this will. Doesn't mean we have to enjoy it. Doesn't mean that we can't wish it away. But we have to stop. And we have to realize that God is in control. And I know sometimes we peer into the smoke and the darkness and even the fog this morning, and it's hard to see him. It's hard to see what good is in this. But God will bring good about. Psalm 66, verse 10 says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. Now, we sing a song once in a while, Refiner's Fire. It's a concept that we should consider as believers. We had a brother share this morning. We sang the song about the potter and the clay. And that's one of those great images of, of God <laughs> spinning us, if you will, around that potter's table pretty fast. And the faster it goes, the more that potter squeezes to get us into the shape. And when it doesn't go the way it wants, he just flattens it and starts all over. But another great picture of the process that we're involved is, is that process of being refined. And that whole picture is so important to us of the, of the silversmith refining the silver in that cauldron with the fire underneath it. And he's refining it with the fire. And the process, most of you know, is that as that fire boils up in that molten metal, that the impurities raise to the top. They call it the dross. And that silversmith will take a ladle and he'll pull across the surface of that molten metal and he'll pull that as impurities that dross off the top and lay them aside. And he'll keep that process going until enough of that impurity is raised to the top that he can look then into the surface of that molten metal and have a reflection of himself. God is that smith in our lives. God is the one who has set the fire stokes that fire and takes us through the process us 
as the molten metal, of bringing the fire of our lives up hot enough that the impurities within us would raise to the top so that he can take them off and bring us into a place of purity such that he could look into our lives and see the image of himself. That's what we're going through. We're the clay on the potter's wheel, we're the molten metal in the cauldron being purified for some great purpose. It's so great that we, we don't even know what it is. But we can't judge it by what we experience here because it's too great to even conceive of. We can let our imaginations run, but we don't know. But it's going to be so good. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9, he tells us that I will bring the remnant through the fire. And understand, that's what we're being brought into is the time of the remnant. God is not only burning off impurities in our lives, but I believe he's burning off impurities within the church, the body of Christ. I think this great challenge that we've had this year, unfortunately, is showing the, the true fitness of Jesus' church. It's not very fit. And things are being laid by the side. People are backing up. People are running away in fear. And I believe we're seeing that last day remnant built up. And it says here in Zechariah 13, 9, I will bring the remnant through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined, like we just spoke about, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. So through the trials, through the fiery trials, as we're being refined, knowing that God Know it, that God is looking at you and saying, this is my people. Those of us that will stand, that will be the remnant, that will not fade. We won't falter, we won't, we won't shy away from the things that we're seeing in this world. We'll be his remnant. And each of us should be prepared to proclaim with full confidence that the Lord is my God. Now God's holiness is the reason that he's a consuming fire. His holiness burns up anything that's unholy. The holiness of God is that part of his nature that most separates him from sinful man. And Isaiah writes that, godless, that the godless tremble before him. That's a different type of fear. We're to fear him. They are afraid of him when they realize what they are. And there's moments even in our own lives because of sin that we may tremble before him until we confess those things and move back into that right place with him. Isaiah says this in chapter 33, verse 14. He said, actually he asks, who among, you, among us shall dwell with a devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? And then Isaiah answers this by saying that only the righteous can withstand the consuming fire of God's wrath against sin. Now, none of us are righteous. Paul tells us in Romans, no one is righteous, no, not one. So who are the righteous? It's those that are covered in the righteousness of our Lord. In ourselves, there is no righteousness. With him upon us, us in him and him in us, we have his righteousness. And it is that righteousness that will protect us against the fiery flames. You've heard the testimonies of the martyrs. You've seen the, the great stories of martyrs like Polycarp, who was put into the fires. And he stood in the fires looking into heaven and he worshipped God. And he wasn't at first consumed. Because the righteousness of God was upon him protecting him. You know, sin is an offense to God's holiness. That's why it is so important that we recognize how sinful sin is. But Isaiah also assures us that no amount of our own righteousness is sufficient to cover that sin. It has to be him. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, it says, We are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. 
I think that verse is so important because if we understand that, believe that to be true, and not let it be far from our thinking, then we will approach the throne of God with a true humility. Because we recognize our condition before the Lord and we will marvel even more that in that condition He saved us anyway. Now the truth is, as we look across the landscape, not just for what we have faced this week, but for so many things that are going on, we're hard-pressed to make sense of what we're seeing. And let's be honest, even the most optimistic among us would have a hard time spinning 2020 in a positive way. But our perspective is based on what we wished life on earth looked like. Do you understand how much we weigh the things we see by what we wished it looked like? And we don't think about that consciously, but it happens all the time. How we react, how we gauge, where we would put it on a scale of not wanting to, to wishing. It's our perspective. But that's just not how it is. The way we see it, the way we want it so often is not how it is, which brings us into a position that we need to be very real about the things that are happening. In understanding them, having some explanation for them and knowing that as was mentioned earlier these are the birth pangs these are the birth pangs that jesus talked about and they're quickening they're quickening and they're increasing and they will do so until we're out of here so we need to be prepared for that and we will be tried as we wait for those but you know too often we overlook the tough things that jesus taught us I think about that a lot. We skim past the difficult passages and we cling to the ones that make us feel good. But the plain truth is, Jesus said some things that are hard to hear. You know, he said that in the world, you and I will have tribulation. And I don't think anybody has that on the mirror at home. I don't think that's a bumper sticker that you would probably put on your car. But it is a direct statement, promise, declaration of our Lord that we will have tribulations in this life. But let's not move beyond that statement without considering the whole verse that that comes from. John sixteen thirty three. These things I have spoken to you that in me, Jesus says, you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's a challenge. I mean, how many of us this week can say that, man, I was just of good cheer all week. I breathed in that smoke and smiled. I watched the videos of all those tragic fires and I, I just felt good about things. It's not that, at that level of ridiculousness. It's not about being happy. It's about having joy. Now, I'm not saying I don't wish happiness for all of you, but happiness to us is, is, is just a kind of a human emotion that we just want to be in that place all the time. I just want to be happy. But really what we should be asking for is the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. It's all we can depend on because that will bring us the good cheer. That's when we'll be able to look at something and understand, you know what? Jesus overcame all of this. He already nailed all of this to the cross. And yet we've got to walk through it right now. We still have battles ahead of us, but the war is won. We are not those that are waiting for victory. We are those that are supposed to be living from victory. But we have to believe what the Bible tells us. Listen to these words that Jesus spoke. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 49. He said, I came to send fire on the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided. Three against two and two against three. 
Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now, I don't believe that Jesus is speaking of fire as we're seeing it around us today. Although we do know from scripture that someday the earth will be burned away and replaced. I believe he's speaking here of the heat of judgment as well as the friction that's caused by the going forth of the gospel message out into a lost world. It may be the fire of the power of the Holy Spirit that could only come after he had accomplished his work on the cross. What I do know is as the world grows colder and colder, the fire of his spirit will burn hotter and brighter than it's ever been. You know, Jesus spoke here of his suffering as a baptism. And, and he was, wasn't just sprinkled with suffering. He was uh, immersed in agony. In, in the same way, we're to be baptized into Jesus and baptized with the Holy Spirit, immersed and overflowing. And as well, sharing, we're told, in the sufferings of Christ. Now, let's consider those two last verses I read again. From now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. And I won't read the next verse, all the different relationships. And I think that verse, although probably applicable back through time, is so important for us to recognize right now. Because the fiery trials of this life and all the things that are coming against us are actually dividing families. They're, they're dividing couples. They're dividing churches. Because there's such a strong polarizing beliefs on both sides of every issue that's happening right now. And, and I would say that those, those discrepancies in our relationships are also things that need to be put on the altar and burned away. We need our relationships to be intact. And in order for them to be intact, we need to make sure that we understand how trivial some of these disagreements are. Now, there are life and death matters that we have to agree on. But there are so many other things that I would put in a gray category, not black nor white, that we need to let those differences dissipate so that we can get along. But I'm seeing so many of the issues of this day. And as we come even closer to a presidential election, even that will divide. We're only supposed to be polarized in one issue. And that is our salvation and who that's in. So we need to be careful. But, and I need you to listen. Though the trials of this, you know, We just need to remember that through all these trials that we have a Heavenly Father that loves us. And I think that's going to become in the days ahead the one central thing that we have to cling to. That we have to remind each other. You know, our God's a consuming fire but He's also love. We're told in the Scripture God is love. We came into this study understanding he's a consuming fire. But his love is as consuming as his fire. And we need to be consumed by it. We need to be enshrouded in it. We need to immerse ourselves in it all the time. But in order to receive the fullness of his love, we need to allow him to burn away everything that's not of him. And that's the only way we're going to receive the fullness of his love. You know, I wonder, could, could we make a list of those things that need to be burned away? I, I'm sure you could. I could. If I'm honest, I could make a list. But you know what? God's so good, he gave us a verse that sums it up for us. And he put a title on it. He put a title over the list. And he called it Works of the Flesh. And this is what he listed there in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19. And he said, now the works of the flesh are evident, so we shouldn't even have trouble finding them. 
And then he lists them and he says, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. He goes on, he says, of which I tell you beforehand. And this is why it's so important to have these things burned out of our lives. He goes on and, and, and he, he answers his own question. He says, just as I have told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he noticed he said practice such things. Any of those things, each of those things can pass through our lives from time to time. But he's talking about those that live in a lifestyle of these things. That's, though, the things that we need to put on the altar. If you can identify with any of those, we need to put those on the altar and let them burn those things away. Anything that we identify with the flesh are things that need to be burned away. And what comes with the burning away of these things? Well, I believe the verses that he followed that verse up with answers that question as well. And he put a title over that. And he called it Fruit of the Spirit. Once we have those things of the flesh burned away, what we have coming fully from our lives is the fruit of the Spirit. And what's that list look like? Well, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the characteristics of the Holy Spirit who lives in us who believe. Once we burn everything out of the way, then really all that's left then is the work of the Spirit. This is how that would be identified, that fruit that comes from our life. And isn't it interesting that in times like we're in now, and it was talked about earlier, when so much now has been literally burned away, that we even see fruit from non-believers. There's something that happens when normal, everyday life that we depend upon is removed. And if there's anything God's doing, I believe, He's removing those things that we find so important to our daily lives. He did it with the virus. He's continuing down that path. He's done it now with these fires. He's stripping away so many things. And I believe he's just calling out to us saying, put your eyes on me. Give me your heart. Lend me all of your thoughts. Put your burden upon me because my burden is light. I think he's telling us all of those things. Now, can we associate our understanding of God as a consuming fire with the fruit of the Spirit? Can we truly comprehend how a God that consumes by fire can also love us to death? I mean, someone could say, doesn't one contradict the other? Well, let's look in the scripture and see. Matthew chapter 11, excuse me, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. It says, I indeed, and this is John the Baptist speaking, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan in his hand is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out the th his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn away the chaff with unquenchable fire. When we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized with spirit and fire. How do I know that? Well, you could testify, if that's you as well, how many of the things of your life were burned away in that time. Part of the process of you coming and asking to be saved was the fact that you recognized how much you were carrying that was killing you spiritually. When we come, we are told that we are justified. That's the process that happens from that heavenly fire. We're justified. In that moment of our salvation, justified. What does that mean? Well, people do the little word play and they say, it's just as if I'd never sinned. 
That's the standing. We're then in front of his altar. That moment that we're saved. It's just as if I never sinned. And then we go through a process for the rest of our lives where we're being sanctified, which means being set apart. And so there's that initial burning away of all of our sin. And then there's that continuing flames of cleansing that happens all the way through our walk with the Lord. You know, here we gather this morning as a church. We call ourselves a church. Not just the church, the building that we come to, but we're a church. And the reason that we have church is because it was a gift to the world by the Lord himself. The church belongs to Jesus. And even the church was born in fire. I want us to start to close thinking about that day. Reading from Acts chapter 1, verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, the disciples, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In chapter 2, verse 1, he goes on. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were each filled and the evidence of their filling with the Holy Spirit on that day of Pentecost, the day the church was born, was to have a tongue of fire on their head. And I believe that to be quite literal. We may not see the tongue of fire on our heads when we come to be believers. But I believe that same fire burns within every life that is called upon Jesus as Lord and Savior. And when we recognize that, then we operate from that place. And we yield, and we wield that fire if we're faithful to that power within us everywhere we go. And every time we open our mouths and speak of the things of the kingdom and the Lord. And that's what happened on that day because they were filled, and Peter, a fisherman, not educated, not eloquent, not a public speaker, goes out with that power within his life. And he wields that fiery power on the crowd. And it says, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. And he went on to give one of the greatest sermons recorded in the Bible. And verses later, it says, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. That's a good meeting. 3,000. The church was born. And then they went on to practice this life that they'd been given, this, this church life, the ecclesia in the Greek, the coming together, the called out ones. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles because of the spirit that burned within them. And it says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I don't want to make light of anything that's happened to anybody this week. I'm not trying to find a metaphor for the fires that people have suffered under physically this week but this topic the lord laid on my heart and i believe it was important for us to look into the scripture consider this term and what it means to us as a church what it means to us as believers having that fire 
that is continuously at work within us, burning off the impurities and bringing us into that refined form that Jesus wants us to be in as we go through this faith journey with him. The church was born in the flames of the Holy Spirit's arrival. And we endure the temporal fires of this physical plane while, we, while we're being formed in the flames of heaven. And we're being made into that image of our Savior. We endure the refiner's fire for our own good and to glorify God. We're baptized by fire. We're formed by fire. We're kept cleansed by fire. And we are even led by fire. And I'll close with these words from Exodus chapter 13, verse 21 and 2. And it's that picture in the wilderness of the Hebrew people being led by the Lord day in and day out. And we're told there, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. I just believe that pillar of fire still exists for each one of us as believers. I believe it exists for us as a church. And I believe that in the darkness of these days, that pillar of fire grows light, very bright, and we need to be looking for it. We need to let it, uh, it lead us in these days. Because I believe he's leading us somewhere. He's not abandoned us. He's not done with us. We're not supposed to be simply sitting in a waiting room for our name to be called. We're to be busy in the things of the Lord. And we need to know that we have the power to go out there and do what he's asked us to do because of that fire that burns within us. And we need to be willing to go through the process of the cleansing of the sanctification and we need to do our part in that and help him by not waiting for him to pluck those things from us and put them on the fire but we need to be those who are willingly throwing those things into the fire wanting the pureness that leads to power and so we've been and we're still in a dark week but the only light that shines in the darkness in this world that will last and that is true is the light of Christ and the only place that that burns brightly and is to be shown forth and observed is in his body. And so we need to be the salt and the light that we've been called to be because it will come from nowhere else. Nowhere else. I think the days, and sometimes I'm, I, I fear even saying it too much, but the days are not going to become easier. But it doesn't have to be hard if we're doing it in the power of the Lord. Put your burdens on him, for his burden is light. Ushers can come up. We'll go into our time of communion to close our morning. And I believe it wouldn't be too early to start those prayers now. To be willing to say to the Lord, that I have this, 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 and this that I need to put upon your altar. That I have this, this, and this that I know about, Lord. But Lord, what else do you see? You can ask him to show you the condition of your heart. But I always warn, if you're going to ask, be prepared to receive. And so come to the communion table this morning, just open to what he might speak to you. As you celebrate the work that he's done for you and the work that he's working out in you. And so, Lord, I thank you this morning for your word, for your, for your guidance, Lord. And, Lord, I join with my brothers and sisters, Lord, as your body, as your church, asking, Lord, that we would be very clear in our hearts and our minds about the things that limit us. And, Lord, I, I pray that we would come to a place where we celebrate the fires from heaven, burning away the dross from our lives and lord i believe you're moving us lord you're calling us sending us lord into a place of purity before your throne and we won't accomplish it all here but lord you have us here for such a time and such a purpose and so lord we come to your table this morning in full celebration and joy 
for the work that you did on our behalf. And so, Lord, we just simply say thank you, and we love you, and we recognize that work. We pray these things, we say these things, in Jesus' name. Amen.